Mesdames et Messieurs, je vous souhaite la bienvenue à tous et à tous. Je vous remercie pour votre présence ce soir et pour votre engagement. C'est vraiment un plaisir de vous accueillir. Good evening. My name is Jean-Paul Goudreau. I'm the Dean of Arts here at Ryerson University. Welcome to our panel on humanities, past, present, and future. I'm delighted to welcome so many of you here tonight. Our students, our faculty, librarians, colleagues from our sister universities, members of the public, and of course, our distinguished panelists. The humanities are at the core of what we do in the arts faculty. And I'm certainly very optimistic about the future of the humanities. The humanities fuel our ideas, our communication, our creative endeavors. The humanities ultimately shape humanity. Universities have to have an interest in seeing the humanities thrive and flourish. Before I introduce our panelists, we have a surprise announcement that I'm confident that will be welcomed by you tonight. This will take just a few moments. With this, I have brought a few special guests. I'd like to now turn the podium over to our provost and vice president academic of Ryerson University, Dr. Mohamed Lashami Mohamed. Thank you very much, Jean-Paul, and merci beaucoup. Good evening. Um, as Ryerson's uh, Provost and Vice President Academic, it's uh, my great honor to welcome you at Ryerson. Toronto is home to a dynamic and culturally diverse community. Our students and researchers benefit. I like to think that we give back to Toronto as a city builder through partnerships, events, and countless interactions. We attract talented people, game, changers, innovators, and thought leaders. We are changing the landscape and serving society in the same time. This is what all universities should do. Ryerson is very proud to host the Humanities Panel. Let me tell you why. We have a responsibility as a university to teach skills in critical thinking and analysis, to help students see the world and new development in connected ways. So this debate on humanities, their role in the past, present, and future is relevant to all of us in the post-secondary sector. We are fortunate to have leading thinkers among us tonight to spark the dialogue. And finally, it's my honor to introduce two people who bring some very exciting news. Jean-Marc Mangin is the executive director of the Federation of Humanities and Social Sciences. Jean-Marc, uh, Jean bienvenue à Ryerson. Ryerson. Jean-Marc has used his humanities degree in political science to great, to great effect. For over two decades, he has led organizations in relief efforts, tackling problems such as drought, food security, and climate change. Jean-Marc has seen firsthand what can be achieved by people who work together to solve problems. We don't wait for crisis to do this work. He's joined by, on stage by Lisa Phillips, Associate Vice President of Research at York University, and Director of Research Policy on the Federation Board of Directors. Lisa is a leading scholar in the fields of tax law, fiscal policy, and feminist legal studies. This evening, Jean-Marc is going to tell us about Congress. It's a city-building event, and one that many universities cover. No other event in Canada brings so many scholars together or shows, so visibility, the value of thinking across disciplines. Jean-Marc, please tell us more. Merci beaucoup. Il me fait un grand plaisir d'être ici ce soir. 
Euh, et je voudrais féliciter Ryerson pour tenir cette conférence et le type d'événement dont nous avons complètement besoin, tellement besoin partout au pays. Donc, euh, un grand merci d'être ici ce soir. The, the Federation, uh, for those of you who don't know, for the humanities and social science, is mandated to promote the humanities and social science. We don't do that because we think it's a nice, cool, mind-binding thing to do. Uh, we do that because it creates meaning in our lives, that it helps us understand the world, and it helps us imagine, shape, and create more vibrant democracies and more human societies. That's the vision behind the Federation. And the Federation was created by a small group of people in 1940, 1941. Uh, Errol Innes was a key actor. And they, 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 they did that because they were, they were compelled by two things. One, the, the appalling state of the humanities and social science in Canada at the time. And a concern that with the onset of World War II, uh, the federal government would then decide what is useful and what is useless science. So, plus ça change, plus c'est pareil. So, it's, it's, uh, the, the, the Federation has grown since then. It now uh, has 79 universities as members, 80 scholarly association from a wide range of disciplines, and 85,000 researchers, including faculty, graduate students, postdocs across the country. It's a very vibrant community and it's a unique Canadian creation. There are, there's other fledgling umbrella uh, organization like uh, elsewhere in the world, but none with the reach that we have and, and the ability to do advocacy, the ability to convene. And that's the second aspect that I, I want to talk to, to today, the Congress of Humanities and Social Science. It used to be called the, the learners, some of you called it the stupids. Uh, the, 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 uh, was a key it's a key moment in the, uh, in the intellectual life of this country. Over 9,000 people gathered every year to, exchange, to, to present their, their, their latest, latest, research, latest research, to debate, to network, and yes, to party. And, and one of your panelists tonight, uh, 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 Stephen Sleeman from New Alberta, uh, organized uh, each year a hell of a dance party, so watch out Toronto. Um, they, 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 so, so, but it's, a, it's, a, it's, it's, it's not only scholars talking to other scholars. It's about, if we're serious about a knowledge society, making that as widely uh, 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 available as possible and invites citizens into the conversation to truly become one of the key moments of, of, our, of our intellectual life to sustain, and, and to sustain that. It's, it's a collective responsibility to, for us to do it. And each year, we, we have a bidding process. We ask universities if they, if they want to host Congress, and if so, why? Why are you interested to bring 9,000 people together and put the, the resources that are required to do so? So Ryerson did present a bid, and uh, on that note, I'm not the person who actually made the decision. It's the board of directors, 13, pe 13 pe people from across the country, uh, from a wide uh, array of discipline. Antonia Mauni is the current president of the board. She would have loved to be here tonight, but she had to be in Regina. Uh, I, I will tell her that uh, Toronto is making a pretty good imitation of Regina's weather, that so she could have come <laughs> here instead. But the, the, uh, I'm very pleased to have Lisa uh, from the board with us, uh, with us tonight and to make the announcement that you're waiting for. Merci, Jean-Marc. Bonjour, tout le monde. I'm Lisa Phillips, and... Um, before I make the announcement, I want to tell you that Congress 2014 is going to be starting on May 24th at Brock University in St. Catharines. Registrations are already booming. It's going to be a fabulous event, so please join us uh, for that. 2015, we'll be moving to the nation's capital. The University of Ottawa will host. We've announced also that in 2016, the University of Calgary will be hosting the Congress. And the big news is, in 2017, Congress will be hosted right here at York Ryerson University.
we are thrilled at the Federation about this development. Uh, Toronto is an incredibly vibrant, multicultural, uh, polyglot city that will have innumerable opportunities to engage public institutions and society in this Congress. We can't wait to see what Ryerson does with it. And I think this is a good moment for me to invite the president of Ryerson University, Sheldon Levy, up to tell us a bit more about a sneak preview, perhaps. Well, uh, thank you very much for that. Uh, wonderful, wonderful news. And maybe I could rewind a bit and uh, tell you, uh, first of all, when uh, the first time I heard of this idea, speaking to Jean-Paul, and I know uh, at the beginning how many people put in the, the effort for the bid, and I want to thank them all personally for obviously their success. But when we were talking about it with Jean-Paul, uh, I think what we were saying is that when people leave on 2017, they will never forget the 2017 Congress at Ryerson. So uh, we were saying things like, uh, if you can't do it uh, well, then go home, or all sorts of expression. But it was really, in a nutshell, a commitment that we were going to do the very, very best Congress. So. Uh, I hope the uh, one in 14, 15, and 16 push us to do even more, but it's an exciting, exciting time for us. And I can uh, assure everyone that it's around the corner and the planning has to be done very, very soon. I also want to assure you that uh, the leadership of Jean-Paul was instrumental, but at the same time, the support of the administration to make sure that uh, we are behind it, and that means uh, both in uh, spirit and effort and, of course, money at times is, is also uh, there. Uh, quite often when we do talk about city building, we, uh, we put it in terms of bricks and mortar, and there will be some really nice bricks and mortars ready, including the Student Learning Center that is uh, coming out of the ground and the, uh, the uh, gallery and the Gould Street and all of that. But in the end, uh, city building is uh, only for one person. It's for people. It's not for an abstract thing. And city building is also uh, part of the responsibility when you bring great events to the city like this and you enrich the city. So this is, in fact, the most important part of uh, city building, which is part of the cultural and historical uh, building of the, of the city and the university. And it's why when we opened the gallery on Gould Street and opened up what we thought was a new cultural street for the City of Toronto, it was so important to us because it was inviting the City of Toronto into Ryerson, but it was also bringing something very special in the humanities, social science, and art to the city. So if there is any reason why anyone would ever be concerned about the, about the future of social science and humanities, I'm going to give you evidence today that you have nothing at all to worry about. So, everyone's wondering, how am I going to give that evidence? <laughs> and maybe someone knows. Maybe Tamika knows. So let me tell you the story about Tamika. Tamika just got uh, admitted to Ryerson for next year into English. But she is so interested and eager to be part of our community that she has come today from Mississauga to be part of this event. And if the world has a lot of Tamikas, then we have no worries at all. And I'm sure there are many Tamikas out there. But this one Tamika, I want to say welcome to Ryerson and welcome to your new community. Thank you, Tamika. So ladies and gentlemen, and uh, on behalf of all of us at Ryerson, it is a very, very proud moment, and we are not going to disappoint. Thank you very, very much. Thank you, Mr. President. I wonder if we could just take a moment and, and uh, have you back up to the podium just for a quick uh, um, photographic uh, moment.
Wait, we have to, now we have to do this uh, properly because this oh. is Ryerson, so we need the blue and gold in every photograph. So. <laughs> so we're going to put it around here. <laughs> our guests. Our, our guests. Guest. Thank our you. Guest. Oh. <laughs> we can keep it. You sure do. <laughs> Thank you. 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 Thank 2017 will be an exciting year, and we hope to have you all back at Ryerson on this campus. And to echo President Levy's comments about the important support that we received through the bid process, uh, the administration of this university has been fantastically supported. We really, we really applaud their impressive leadership, um, and Sheldon and Mohammed in particular, we really appreciate your great support of the humanities and the Faculty of Arts for taking the lead on this bid. Thank you so much. I would like to take a moment to thank the impressive team that envisioned and organized this event. The event is generously sponsored by the English department and spearheaded by Dr. Nima Nagibi, the interim chair of English. And I, I believe I want to see if I can spot Nima. She's in red, I believe. There she is right there, Nima, please. <laughs> Thank you, Nima. We really appreciate your leadership. It's fantastic. I want to thank Charmaine McKenzie and Monica Yako and their team in the Dean's Office who organized the event. I thank our engaged humanities chairs in the Faculty of Arts, Arts and Contemporary Studies with Dr. Stephanie Walsh Matthews, History, Dr. Catherine Ellis, Languages, Literatures and Cultures, and Dr. Marco Fiola, and in Philosophy, Dr. Andrew Hunter, for enthusiastically collaborating on this fantastic event tonight. Of course, and I want to thank our panelist and moderator. So it now gives me great pleasure to introduce each in turn. I will read short bios. The full bios are available on, on Flybits if you've uh, downloaded that to your, your smartphone. Uh, and then I will, t I will ask each of the uh, panelists to come to uh, the stage. Our first panelist, Dr. Mariana Hirsch, who joins us from Columbia University. She is the William Peterfield Trent Professor of English and Comparative Literature, and a professor in the Institute of Research on Women, Gender, and Sexuality. Internationally renowned for her work on post-memory, she is the author of many influential books, including The Generation of Post-Memory, Writing and Visual Culture After the Holocaust. Mariana is the immediate past president 2013 of the Modern Language Association of America. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Mariana Hirsch to the podium. Thank you. Our second panelist is Dr. Stephen Slemon, a professor of English and film studies at the University of Alberta. He is the author of numerous articles and chapters discussing post-colonial literatures and critical theory. Stephen is currently the president of the Association of Canadian College and University Teachers of English. It's a mouthful, so we abbreviate it with an acronym called ACUTE. And it's an apt acronym for the focus on the humanities here tonight. Stephen is also a longtime board member of the Federation of the Humanities and Social Sciences of Canada. And I've had the great pleasure of working with Stephen on the board for two years. He's an outspoken advocate for the humanities. Please welcome Dr. Stephen Slemon to Ryerson. Our third panelist is Dr. John Rawson Saul, an award-winning essayist and novelist who has had a growing impact on political and economic thought throughout many countries. He is the author of numerous books, including On Equilibrium, Six Qualities of the New Humanism. His work has been translated into 22 different languages. Time Magazine has declared him a prophet. Wow, that's great. 
and ranked him among the leading thinkers. He is president of Penn International and a proud, distinguished visiting professor in the Faculty of Arts at Ryerson University. Please welcome Dr. John Rawson Saul. Our moderator tonight is Dr. Irena Gamel, a professor of English who holds the Canada Research Chair in Modern Literature and Culture here at Ryerson University. She's the author and editor of numerous books, including Looking for Anne, How Lucy Maud Montgomery Dreamt Up a Literary Classic. A popular mentor to students through her MLC Research Center, she has pioneered new methods of experiential learning and has helped many students, and there are many here tonight in the audience, uh, to uh, make the academic transition into their professional careers. Please welcome Dr. Irena Gamble. And, and without further ado, I turn it over to our moderator and look forward to an engaging discussion here tonight. Thank you very much, and gros merci. Good evening, everybody. We've already had a lot of excitement, and I hope we will continue to add to that. It's fantastic to see this uh, great turnout here tonight with so many people, students. I know they are very, very excited, and we look forward to all of the questions. I think it's also fantastic, and I just want to say congratulations to Ryerson for being awarded uh, Congress 2017. I think that will bring a lot of energy to the campus, to the arts faculty, to the humanities, and of course to the social sciences as well. Uh, but I also want to say congratulations to uh, the Federation because I think it's a fantastic match to have the Federation lined up uh, with Ryerson University and kind of uh, experience uh, a new spirit of doing things involving very heavily digital media and so forth. So I'm delighted to be here tonight with this distinguished panel of um, speakers. Uh, and together, I think we are hoping to move forward the discussion of the humanities themselves and, of course, also with the audience. So we are really looking forward to your engagement. Tonight is the night when we really want to reinvigorate the humanities. The humanities most generally involve the study of human culture, and that is poetry, language, persuasion, ethics, philosophy, literature. These, one might say, are also the very domains that humanize us, that are very important to our, our beings and our society. Tonight, we don't just want to hear about what's not working or about the problems with underfunding. Those problems are very, very real, no doubt about it. But tonight we also hope to be inspired. We hope to inspire each other about the world of ideas, the ideas that really bring us together, that galvanize us, that fuel our passion. And so ultimately, these ideas also transform us and transform us as a society. And to that end tonight, I know the onus is very heavy, but we are looking toward the audience for ideas. Ideas are generally born at the grassroots, and we are looking toward our panelists, our distinguished speakers who will be bringing their ideas uh, to us. So our format tonight is very simple. Our speakers will each deliver uh, a brief, uh, just brief comments, uh, uh, no more than 13 minutes, about their view of the humanities, past, present, and future. And after these remarks, we will have about 30 to 40 minutes uh, for our audience to comment and uh, pose questions to advance our conversation. So the, the idea is really to have a, a turn-taking, a nice conversation between the, the all of us. And now I ask Dr. Marianne Hirsch to come to the podium for a few remarks, and let's please give her a second warm Canadian welcome. Marianne. 
Bonsoir et merci de l'invitation. C'est un grand plaisir d'être parmi vous. Good evening and thank you so much for the invitation. Thank you to the English department, to Jean-Paul and to Ryerson University for sponsoring this really exciting discussion. So who will lead America into a bright future? Citizens who are educated in the broadest possible sense so that they can participate in their own governance and engage with the world. An adaptable and creative workforce, experts in national security equipped with the cultural understanding, knowledge of social dynamics and language proficiency to lead our foreign service and military through complex global conflicts. Elected officials and a broader public who exercise civil political discourse founded on an appreciation of the um, ways our differences and commonalities have shaped our rich history. We must prepare the next generation to be these future leaders. You can see that I stumbled, so these are not my words. Uh, this is really, this is actually the beginning of the Heart of the Matter report on the humanities and social sciences that came out in the US last summer. The report was sponsored by the US Congress and it was undertaken by a commission of very distinguished um, academic and civil and political leaders under the auspices of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences. The idea was to produce a report that would articulate the value of the humanities and social sciences and promote the important, their importance, and this in the aftermath of a 2007 influential blueprint on the future of the STEM fields, science, technology, engineering, and medicine, that was entitled, tellingly, Rising Above the Gathering Storm. So I wanted to read you the beginning of this report to show you how it was framed. Very grand language, future leaders, bright futures, cultural understanding, national security. The report's cover was a huge United States flag and its colors, not surprisingly, red, white, and blue. The report outlines, don't get me wrong, the report outlines a multifaceted program of education in language, in critical thinking, in interdisciplinary training, in innovation and public engagement that all of us can certainly support. It promotes support for teachers and scholars. It's dedicated to communicating the importance of humanities research to the general public. In no way do I want to be critical of its recommendations, nor of the intense and provocative public discussion that the report spurred last summer in conjunction with a parallel report that came out at approximately the same time that was issued by Harvard University. But I do wonder whether the premises on which these two reports and the discussions that have ensued are based offer the most helpful approach to strengthening the humanities in the eyes of this large and rather vaguely defined public that they address. And these premises, which no doubt begin as purely strategic, what we think they want to hear, are shaping our discussions and I think are beginning to shape our very ways of thinking, and I think they're worth being scrutinized, and I'm going to suggest displaced or replaced. On the one hand, these premises, these reports rest on a premise of competition. Competition among fields, sciences versus humanities, the Harvard report especially is very concerned with enrollments and majors in humanities and social science fields as opposed to the sciences but also global economic competition and the competition embedded in the language of national security and the flags. On the other hand, they invoke a premise of value, the value of the humanities and social science education that responds to the competitive framework that's set out. And so you could see that these related premises would, want, would elicit well-known and significant if by now somewhat predictable arguments on behalf precisely of the value of the study of the humanities. Arguments that necessarily place us into a defensive posture. Because this is not a value structure that we control. We are subject to it. And in response, we can, we can only articulate instrumental arguments that measure 
the employability of humanities graduates, the skills they acquire, enabling them to compete in the market as intelligent global citizens. Humanities students certainly learn critical thinking and analysis. They learn good writing as well as languages. Um, and all, as has, all of this, as has been established repeatedly, are valuable and valued by potential employers. Humanities graduates get good jobs. Uh, they learn more than that. They learn empathy, sensitivity, compassion, imaginative identification with others. And all of these are deemed valuable for transnational engagements. So this is the instrumental argument that's put forth in response to this competition scheme. To that, usually we need to add more. We, we need to supplement it by the defense of more intangible values that can't easily be measured or instrumentalized. Pleasure, richness, human interconnection, aesthetic, ethical, sensorial understanding and appreciation, greater empathy and ability to relate to others, and enhanced humanity. So as convincing and potentially effective as these arguments are, and as much as I personally believe in all of them, I want to suggest that they're also profoundly constraining. Because these two sets of arguments, instrumental and intangible, are really two sides of the same coin. And I found very helpful a recent formulation by Judith Butler, whose essay um, I want to quote in a new publication called The Humanities and Public Life, edited by Peter Brooks that just came out um, from Fordham University Press. And there Butler asks whether it's possible to defend the humanities without using the same framework of values that demands such a defense in the first place, one that structures knowledge precisely in instrumental measurable terms. How can we both measure up to the demands of our politicians and our funders and in, in her terms, quote, think critically about the modes of measurement and schemes of evaluation in order to figure out which ones are justified, which ones really suit their objects. Is there a way out of this conundrum? How might we be able to use our critical training as humanists to reframe the conversation? How might we mobilize the textual, historical, theoretical, and activist work that we do as humanities scholars and educators to intervene positively rather than defensively in these conversations. So I'd like to suggest that we reframe the conversation in three ways that I'd like to, I only have time to mention briefly. And first, um, and here's uh, where my work as president of MLA comes in, um, I'm bringing bad news from south of the border um, because before we even, in, in the leadership of uh, Association of Teachers and Scholars of Languages and Literatures of nearly 30,000 members, we really would like to talk about literature and language, but we really need to do something else. We need to advocate for the labor conditions of our members. Uh, we have to worry, and, and uh, we have to worry about the cost of a college degree to our students, the drastic increase in student debt, the limited funding for graduate education in the humanities, which I gather is a very big factor in Canada as well, the cutbacks in jobs, especially tenure track jobs, and the severe exploitation of part-time and non-tenure track faculty in our departments, and also in the US, the growing disparity between public and private institutions. Even today, the latest issue of the Chronicle of Higher Education has an article on the kind of demise of public um, institutions um, in the U US. We have to think about adjunct non-tenure track faculty issues creatively and in solidarity with our tenure track colleagues. And I'd like to say that it's precisely the critical perspective we learn in our humanities education that should enable us to see the connections between these labor questions and the questions of college costs and to refuse to set up with the question of the humanities and to refuse to separate these problems from each other and also to see that in these questions we have to work together with our colleagues in sciences and in the STEM fields that these are not separate issues and co collaboration and coalition is needed. Second, um, I think, is where a historical perspective comes in um, and this is where the past, present and future uh, of this panel is really important. So I think that um, 
the historical perspective is belied by the ways in which usually this debate is framed, which is to think in, under a framework of crisis. And by thinking about a framework of crisis, it's, it becomes impossible to have a sustained conversation about the vulnerability of the humanities that is certainly not new. And um, if we move from crisis to crisis, we forget the last one, we move on to the next one, and we can't have a sustained conversation. So in reframing this, I would suggest a different framework. I would suggest that we look historically at what's happened with a dramatic, a wonderful thing, a dramatic increase in the number of students who go to college in the last decades. In, and because of this dramatic increase, humanities education has become to seem a luxury for an elite rather than the ground on which education has to be built. And uh, so because, given these demographic shifts and given cuts in funding, we need to acknowledge the long-term vulnerability of the humanities and to, become, to begin the discussion from that premise of vulnerability. And I find the frame of vulnerability much more helpful than the frame of crisis because I think it does enable us to have a more sustained conversation about strategies for survival and renewal, a longer range approach to perhaps more creative and sustainable solution than the alarmist talk of crisis and its occlusions have offered the humanities in the academy. And if we're going to begin from a premise of vulnerability, it seems to me that the work that we do in the humanities in the academy can be helpful because I think that that's what we do we te and, and teach in the humanities. We teach how to foster the openness and vulnerability that we are encountering in relation to our fields, our acts of reading and looking and listening, the aesthetic encounters that we stage for our students. Um, these practices teach openness, interconnection, and imagination. And thus, in allowing ourselves to be vulnerable, we transmit that vulnerability to our students and we can mobilize that perhaps to think about the state of the humanities as well. Third, um, I think such an acknowledgement of vulnerability will also reveal the interconnections that should prevent us from isolating the humanities from social sciences and sciences. From narrative medicine to digital humanities to the turn to big data and literary studies to epigenetics and brain imaging in my own field, memory studies, it's clear that we are in a set of important transdisciplinary conversations. Um, and there's so many problems that require collaborative transdisciplinary approaches and solutions, but at the same time, I think interdisciplinarity, especially if it crosses what used to be called the two-culture divide, brings with it a number of challenges. So I'd like to spend a couple of minutes to think about what is the status of the humanities in, this, in these transdisciplinary conversations. Are we equal par partners? Or are we, as I sometimes feel, the ethicists that authorize groundbreaking research that we fail to understand. So what is not the value, but the truth value of our work? It stakes as discovery and as innovation. Um, have you ever been um, as humanities uh, representatives um, on grand panels that treat humanities proposals equally with science proposals? I haven't, because in my experience, humanities proposals are expected to be more comprehensible, less specialized. No one outside the field expects to understand the math or science proposals. Everyone marks down the humanities proposals if, they're not, if they don't fully understand them. So what, can we, what does this say about an acknowledgement of our own specialized knowledge and discovery? So it seems to me that if we want to respond to this, these practices without defensiveness, Maybe we should mark down the science proposals we don't understand. They're all supposed to be written clearly. So if we stop being defensive, we might begin to articulate our own discoveries, to claim their creativity and innovation, to claim their import for work in the university more generally, including in the STEM fields. Think of the last decades of humanities work, the reframing just as an example, the reframing of our thinking about gender and sexuality, about race, about empire, about migration, about colonization, about how power works through language, through affect, through embodiment, about the effects of violent histories of the past on the present. Would it be possible to shift, just for an example, 
the situation of women and of gay and bisexual people in our societies as profoundly as we have without analyzing language and without changing language. Is it possible indeed to work in a globalized world and to think about globalization without thinking profoundly about language and about translation, without slowing things down to point out the untranslatabilities? I often think that our job is to slow things down, and we have this little phrase that we, when we apply for grants from the, the center that I'm heading on social difference, we say we, we engage in slow thought. Um, it's sort of like slow food. Um, so the question is, can we be, can behavior change without new ways of thinking and new paradigms of knowledge? I think it's up to us right now to claim these paradigms as forms of discovery, as forms of innovation, and as the necessary ground on which much scientific research uh, about some of these very same topics can be undertaken. So forgive me for getting preachy. I think um, that's pretty much what one does in these, when one engages these topics, but I think it's up to us to get out of crisis mode, to get out of defensiveness and dejection, to claim our accomplishments and to assert the value of practicing new ways of thinking about new and old problems. And I think it's only thus that we can survive in vulnerable times. Thank you. Thank you so much, Marian Hirsch. Very, very nice. <clears throat> And uh, I also thought the uh, insights sort of from th south of the border are quite fascinating, and then to see how that relates to uh, Canada. Uh, we will hold our questions until all speakers have uh, presented their uh, brief remarks. And so without much further ado, I'm now calling uh, to the podium Dr. Stephen Slamon. Je voudrais dire que je suis aussi tellement content I am also beyond flattered to be a part of this otherwise ridiculously distinguished panel, and I'm thrilled to join, as it happens, in a celebration of one of the best decisions the Federation has ever made. Uh, 2017 isn't just any year for Congress, it's what they call the sesquicentenary, it's 150 years, and that's very big news. This city and its multicultural cosmopolitanism can bring a new vision a uh, forward-looking vision of inclusion and equity to the Canadian humanities. Um, my thanks to the radiant Professor Nima Nagibi, who is Interim Chair of English in, uh, uh, um, at this university, an outstanding scholar of transculturalism. I do not know a better organizer. My thanks to you too, Jean-Paul um, Ryerson. You could not have a more capable and visionary advocate in the Ottawa boardrooms. Thanks to the many departments and programs that have envisioned the support for this event tonight. Thank you, too, in advance for listening to me. Um, and those of you who are standing at the back, there are now chairs in the front that at least I have vacated, and so you should at least feel free to sit down. <laughs> we meet tonight in the darkening shadows of a humanity crisis industry. And here are just a few of the recent headlines. Humanities fall from favor. Prestige of the humanities at all time low. And oh, the humanities, big trouble, but there's still some hope. <laughs> big trouble, some hope. I'm about to argue that the humanities do make trouble en route to social hope. That is their foundational purpose, and how they get there has nothing to do with mastery over a single object of study. We do not simply train to a given task. Years, years after you've forgotten that that mid-Victorian novel you studied in first-year English was set in some manor house called Thornfield Hall, you still remember discovering that you fell in love with that book, not just because Jane Eyre was brave and admirable and deservedly got her man in the end, but because studying the book deeply made you understand all kinds of social systems and then bring them together. The class system, marriage property laws, educational policy, colonial history, the evangelical movement, the nuclear family and its omissions, women and labor, bourgeois liberalism, proto-feminism. You, you forget those details, but you remember that you have to put things together, interpretively, critically, in order to understand. Maybe you remember that behind what you learned 
there was research and that it really helped you to get to the difficulty in the material. You certainly remember that it was one thing to have in place a whole series of informing social systems, another to assemble them into an explanatory narrative. You learn in the humanities that everything depends on how that narrative gets told. The socially dominant narrative behind today's crisis in the humanities might as well begin with these words. Dearly beloved, we are gathered here today to celebrate the life and honor the memory of the humanities as we have known them. Some of the crisis reports splash tears over a humanities that once taught individual refinement and character, but now just teach technical writing skills. Some of them weep for a younger and more innocent time when the humanities were known and recognized for their capacity to generate cultural and economic prosperity. A lot of the eulogizing dwells obsessively on the declining years of the humanities. Student enrollments down 20% over the last decade at Harvard. Student enrollments down by a shocking 50% since the 1970s. Numbers ad nauseum. And it would not be a funeral without some crowing over the corpse. The Australian Prime Minister's first promise after his election win last September was stop to stop funding quote, increasingly ridiculous research projects. And he gave some examples. A peer-reviewed study that looked at how public art represents climate change. Wasteful. A study examining how certain Islamic interpretations of sexuality needed to be understood within contemporary approaches to reproductive health. Futile. The various reports on the death of the humanities for or against fused together to form a master narrative of our obituary. And our usual counter strategy from within the open coffin has to been to rebut the substance of these claims separately. Let me be clear. Detailed, evidence-based rebuttals in defense of the humanities really do matter. And we must, as Marianne said, continue to make them strenuously. In response to the general claim that the humanities have fallen from a golden age, brought low, and here you name it, brought low by critical theory, by technical language, by feminism, post-colonialism, cultural studies, queer studies, against that prevalent myth, I like to remember a book by one of Marianne's colleagues at Columbia, Gauri Vaswanathan, a book which demonstrates that my discipline, for example, English studies, didn't just begin on some Olympian pastoral meadow of interpretive dancing and poetry, but actually found its start in British India in the 1830s as an instrument of establishing imperial hegemony, colonial domination by consent. And in response to the general assumption that the humanities have now become passe and insufficient in the work of economic prosperity, it remains crucial to demonstrate, as so many excellent blog postings and newspaper articles have repeatedly pointed out over the past two years, that training in the humanities produces precisely those skill sets that business and industry are looking to, especially in Canada, as we shift out of a fortist and resource-based economy into small and middle-sized entrepreneurship and innovation. Communication, research skills, writing skills, and actually that's too soft a word, writing skills. We don't just teach writing skills, we teach writing flair. Collaborative thinking, problem solving, more important problem finding, cultural literacy, religious literacy, cross-cultural literacy, empathy. Humanity students are the hot new hires of the contemporary corporate world and we have to keep proving that it really is so. Here is just one engaging statistic which I'd like to flag especially for Tamika and for those other high school students who may be here en route to your Ryerson Humanities. And here it is. The Association of American Colleges and Universities has just published a study that shows between the ages of 56 and 60, long time off, but those are your peak earning years. In those years, liberal arts graduates actually earn more than do graduating majors from the professional programs. More money, not less. More money, not less. I don't think that's a fact you've been hearing. And in response to the ubiquitous claim that student enrollment numbers in the humanities are plummeting as Canada globalizes and as students wake up to new economic realities, 
it is important to remember that everything also depends on how you count. Humanities majors are down in the elite research universities, but that's majors, not student minors, uh, not account of those students who take courses variously as they create their own programs of study. The Association of Universities and Colleges in Canada reports that humanities enrollments are actually way up since the late 90s when you look across the post-secondary system. The humanities disciplines are not just being crushed by the looming Darth Vader-like presence of the science, technology, engineering, and mathematics, the STEM disciplines. The largest growth in student enrollments over the past 50 years has been in the social sciences. The social sciences, our interdisciplinary collaborators, our friends. Canadians are not, Canadian students are not simply opting out of the humanities disciplines. And if there is a single motor behind the decline of reputation for the academic humanities now, it is the corporatization of the public university into an industry partnering, profit-taking enterprise designed for private economic profit-taking at the expense of genuine social wealth. But point by point rebuttal of the individual cause of death claims for the humanities will not transform the dominant narrative that constructs the humanities crisis industry. The narrative of wholesale university repurposing towards the goal of easily accountable economic development. That narrative does more than just energize, energize the crisis industry. It also justifies why women's studies programs and language studies programs uh, across the post-secondary spectrum are being systematically reduced and attenuated. It justifies why entire programs in English and philosophy just got cancelled and all the, staff dismissed, all the staff dismissed at Australia's aptly named Charles Darwin University. <laughs> it informs the Harper government's manipulative redeployment of research funding within the Social Sciences and Humanities Research of Council into industry partnership programs so that success rate in the standard and now insight grant envelope has dropped from 42 percent 14 years ago to 21 percent in 2012. And the fact that the National Science and Engineering Research Council funding for basic research has fallen from 50 percent to 38 percent of the overall budget in very recent years. Uh, so that NSERC's University to Industry Technology Transfer Program can swell. That dominant narrative of pragmatic university corporatization justifies why it is that reportedly three quarters of the faculty now teaching in post-secondary institutions in North America are hired not into the tenure track, but as contract academic faculty, most of them teaching without job security without benefits, without a pension plan, most of them working without decision-making voice within their own departments and faculties, many of them working full-time and earning about one quarter of what their tenure and tenure-track colleagues earn, and all of them doing academic labor without meaningful access to the exercise of academic freedom. We need to make trouble with this justifying narrative and to tell our stories differently. The World Economic Forum today places Canada 35th on the gender gap for wage equity and 41st on the gender gap for political empowerment. Recent legal decisions in Arizona and India and Uganda demonstrate painfully that global inclusion and equity for LGBTQ peoples remains a very distant future project. 63% of First Nations children in Saskatchewan and Manitoba live below the poverty line. Our health in the humanities disciplines resides in profound ways in the histories, philosophies, art forms, and knowledges of exactly those people made marginalized by the master narrative of global neoliberalism. We will not save ourselves from the real crisis if we instrumentalize our humanities disciplines into training centers for business writing, or reduce our disciplinary research aspirations to unequal participation in some government-inspired interdisciplinary project designed to bring university and industry partners together in pursuit of economic gain. The institutional humanities can lose heart. But what holds us is our capacity to provide intellectual compass to those marginalized, disenfranchised, and yet hopeful individuals and communities who come to the seat of learning in search 
of social change. Where the humanities give hope is in their constant and unstoppable commitment to trouble the dominant narratives of our and other times. To read those narratives critically, to locate and, understanding and understand their informing sources, to, to reassemble their story parts into alignment with different ways of seeing, and then to tell it otherwise. Equity, inclusion, mutuality, understanding, participatory citizenship, these are the hopes that underwrite the only certain future for the academic humanities. They are why it is that a final death notice for the academic humanities can never quite be written. Thank you. Thank you so much, Stephen, also for your critical lens here and for your passion. I mean, your passion for the humanities is, is quite evident. I also thought it was fascinating to see some of the parallels between uh, the two talks to sort of focus on the discourses of crisis, uh, empathy, and so forth. So I look forward to discussion and uh, uh, looking at some of these in more detail. For now, I would like us to welcome our third speaker. Uh, Dr. John Ralston Saul. Please welcome him. Premièrement, je suis très content de voir que tout le monde parle français dans une université où peut-être on pense que c'est pas le cas, mais c'est le cas et on le fait avec grâce et avec un grand niveau de confort, donc c'est très très bien. Et euh, euh, Je crois qu'il y a un thème, je suis tout à fait d'accord avec ce qui a été dit jusque-là. And you began with a quote, and I'm going to begin with a quote, um, which will, in a sense, fit with yours. I'll, I'll just read it out. Um, the past century proclaimed the equality of citizens before the law, the 19th century, a conquest carrying formidable weight. This century, the 20th, upholds, in fact, consolidates this principle, but adds another, which is nonetheless fundamental, the equality of men before work, understood as a duty and a right, as a creative joy that broadens and ennobles existence rather than mortify or depress it. Now, it could have been from the same report. Uh, it could be from the reasons, the papers telling us that we should be reorganizing our universities around the management structures that have just been mentioned. It is, of course, from Benito Mussolini. That's what's known as a cheap shot. Um, and in fact, the phrase it was, this century upholds, it was this fascist century upholds. And the point I, the only reason I quote that is simply to say that the arguments that are being made about the attacks on the humanities and the, feeling, the, the problems of measurement, uh, the desire to push the humanities in the direction of utilitarianism and measurement, don't come simply out of the business schools, although they do, or out of the rise of the managerial religion which dominates today, that it has very, very deep roots and that you can find most of what is treated today as mainstream thought about how we should organize society and run society and therefore educate kids and hire professors, you can find all of that at various points in history, but very specifically in the 1920s and 30s with the rise of corporatism, which was later called fascism and Nazism. But when you strip away the racism and the uniforms and the desire for war, what you find underneath all of that was a shared philosophical belief in corporatism, which was the idea that we are essentially utilitarian people, and that, we, that, that individualism, whether responsible or unresponsible, has failed, and that we should be organized on the basis of self-interest and interest groups. And we should have stakeholder meetings, for example, a profoundly fascist idea that people are only brought together on the basis of self-interest, not on the basis of the public interest, which is what someone in the humanities would say. So uh, let me add a second sort of 
cheap shot for the beginning, which is that as president of Penn International, I'm obliged to point out that today there are approximately 850 writers in prison around the world today, plus about another 50 were killed, so let's say 900 uh, a year. Um, almost all of them, whatever they do, are the product of the humanities. Um, there are virtually no, uh, well, there are no economists in prison as far as I know. <laughs> Excuse me. Um, there are almost no soldiers, there are almost no business school people, etc. Now, it's very, this is low what I'm saying. You've heard the high argument. I'm taking the low road. And the low road is true. There are almost 900 people either in prison or being killed a year because of the power of the humanities. Why, why is Lu Xiaobo in prison? Why are these people in prison? They just said something. They just made an argument, a humanities argument, essentially, about the role of people in society. And this terrifies money. It terrifies military power. It terrifies political power. Otherwise, they wouldn't be in prison. I know the list. These are people who don't have a gun, don't have much money, don't have a bank. They're in prison. This tells you that not only are the humanities not dying, they're, in a sense, as powerful or more powerful than they've ever been. So I think there is, an, indeed, an enormous danger in any step taken by the humanities to please the ruling ethic of the day. It is that old argument, you know, well, racism is back. Maybe we should be a little careful about what we say. And it's the same sort of thing. Managerialism is in. Utilitarianism is in. We must be careful to prove. And I'm not saying your numbers are wrong about the jobs and all the rest. You're right. But my experience is it doesn't matter that we make those arguments and prove it. They simply are not interested because they're not interested in thinking people being in positions of influence and authority. They're interested in a managerial approach towards society, an approach which does not have ideas in it, which is not about public argument and public debate. It, you know, it is, you know, w w I always say to people, well, you, I go out there and ask people, you know, what do they understand about Russia today? You know, the last 200 and so years. And you'll discover that not one of them is basing what they understand about Russia on some sort of uh, um, utilitarian argument. It's all based on Tolstoy and Dostoevsky and <laughs> Chekhov. That's what our understanding of Russia comes from, with good reason because these are the thinking interpretations of real societies. So I think that, in a sense, we in the humanities have failed, not because we've become too complicated, but because, in a sense, we've forgotten, to some extent, in doing all the good that we're doing, but we've forgotten, to some extent, that the roots of the humanities are not in utilitarianism, but they're in relevance. And when I say relevance, I'm not, I think the example that was given about the PhDs not being relevant is, you know, it, it's, when you know that prime minister, for example, in Australia, it's deeply funny. I mean, I had breakfast with them a little while ago. This is not a competent person, to put it politely. Um, uh, very politely. Uh, and hardly functional. The fact that he's there is a mystery, a total mystery. But, 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 but we have to say to ourselves that the roots of the humanities lie in a sense of, well, how are we going to live the life? How are we going to live the, the, the examined life? And therefore, it, is, it, it has a universal side to it. It has a, you know, what are we doing all around the world? But it's always had, right from its roots, a very local side to it. It's relevant to the societies in question. And, and I think what that means is that we have to look very carefully, for example, in Canada, allow me to be not provincial, but relevant, you know? Uh, that, that we have to think, well, what can the humanities do in Canada? What is it that, w that we can do that's interesting to Canadians so that they can use that, A, to live in Canada, and B, that when they go somewhere else, they have something to say which actually comes out of the roots, the ground, the place, the experience, the reality. That's not utilitarianism. That's actually the, that's something that Erasmus would have said, a, a much better than me or Vico would have said, you know, or Confucius would have said when he's interpreted properly. Um, you know, as opposed to the way the governments tended to interpret Confucius to, as a utilitarianism which, uh, man, which he wasn't at all. So I, uh, let me just give you a single example. 
our universities are structured and our humanities are structured to a great extent as inheritors of the European tradition of the university. I know how that happened. We all know how that happened. And lots of good stuff came out of Europe. Um, and I think it's actually become more and more that way as we've gone further and further down a sort of linear road, a footnoted road, a, 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 a reference back to road. And as I'm constantly joking, if you look at our, the way we teach philosophy, nothing original has been thought in Canada in 400 years. I mean, so bad that Charles Taylor was forced out of the philosophy department, right? And that McLuhan and Innes are not taught in philosophy because you can't have original thought in a North American philosophy department. In the States, there's a little bit, but even there, the original thinkers are pushed to the edges because it's all got to relate back to Immanuel, Kant, you know, or, or whoever. And so we really have to think to ourselves, is this right? Is this the way to do it? I mean, if we can't put uh, Innes in philosophy, there's something wrong with the way we're thinking about philosophy. If we can't put McLuhan in philosophy, there's something wrong. And if Charles Taylor has to be moved to, was it political science or something? There's something deeply wrong. And I'm not just picking on one area. I'm saying there's an approach there, which is basically 400 years of following the European model. And I'll give you a very simple example, which is this country um, you know, has two official languages. One quarter of the population speaks and lives in French, and uh, 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 half of the bilingual and bicultural people in Canada are Anglophone, which has been done in the last 40 years. So that takes it up over 30, 35% or something like that. If you are in the English department, you start with Chaucer or whoever, and you work your way painfully through and end up with some Canadians at the end. I'm simplifying grossly, Randy, right? But it's still, and, but you know, and you're allowed a bit of the British Empire sort of as an outcome of the English language process. And then you go to the Université de Montréal, and the same thing happens starting with, you know, the French writers, and you gradually work your way towards some French-Canadian writers with a few tips of the hat to some people in Algeria, whatever. So that you can have uh, the most famous Anglophone writer and the most famous Francophone writer in Canada living side by side in Montreal or in Toronto. Their children can fall in love, have sex, produce children. Their fathers can ang get angry and whatever. But you can't study them together. You cannot study them together because we have not rethought literature in terms of Canada. In term we actually teach literature as if Canada doesn't exist as if it can't exist to have those two cultures to say nothing of, you know, the way we do our poetry anthologies. In the beginning, the poetry anthologies were English, French, and actually there were some other uh, immigrant groups who had interesting poets in them, and they were in there. Now it's all been divided up neatly, very, very neatly, so that if I say to you that the greatest anti-war poet of Canada is Stephen Gay Stephenson, who happens to be also the most important early modern poet of Iceland, he lived and ran a farm in Alberta, He's not taught as, because where does Icelandic po uh, poetry fit into Canadian literature, into anti-war poetry? We're, in other words, what I'm saying is that there's a desperate need, I think, to do the exact opposite of what we're being asked to do, which is to imitate the utilitarian. There's a desperate need to move in the other direction and to say, let's do something that they're not doing in Colombia. Not because it's better or worse, but because it's different. Let's do something they're not doing at Harvard or at uh, in the Cambridge or the Oxford tradition. Let's do something which is totally relevant here. And when you're in a city, which is the most single most experimental city in the world, in terms of uh, 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 the, the, the population and the way the population lives, over 50% born elsewhere, uh, every language in the world, a different way of people living together, you have to not simply have a, a wide choice of courses, you have to rethink the way literature is taught, the way philosophy is taught. There's a real need to go back, as, as you know, when those, those young people walked off in whatever century it was, the, the island in the middle of Paris and set up the Sorbonne on the left bank, we have to literally do that. We could stay in these rooms because they're not bad, <laughs> but we actually have to have some kind of internal revolution where we rethink completely what literature, what uh, philosophy, what the humanities are supposed to look and sound and act like uh, in this place, and I think the same is true about New York or the same is true about the Western United States. We have to reject 
I'm, 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 I'm being overly simplistic on purpose. I believe more and more, with every month I believe this more and more, we have to profoundly reject the European university tradition. We have to drop the idea of international measurement completely. We have to come up with the idea that there is originality and need for deep intellectual thought and questioning everywhere, and it is different everywhere. And that is how you get an interesting international conversation going, is through the positivism of difference, not through, well, we're all teaching the same way and we're rated in the following way. And my last comment is simply this. Um, uh, I think the other element which is particularly important in the humanities in Canada is that um, uh, we are extremely fortunate that in spite of acting extremely badly for over a century towards Aboriginal peoples, we have the fastest growing uh, part of the Canadian population is Aboriginal. The university population of Aboriginals is growing by leaps and bounds. The number of young and brilliant Aboriginal professors in our universities, including this university led by Hayden King, uh, are, are growing by leaps and bounds. Some of the best philosophy being written in this country is written about, Europe, about, about Aboriginal philosophy without reference to European philosophy by people like Richard Atlio, the father of the National Chief, and so on. And we're not taking this into account. We're, we're starting to get this, the groups, you know, the Aboriginal study groups here and so on. But I think that we need to take the way we teach literature, the way we teach philosophy, and so on, and say, in Canada, how do we insert right into the core of it Aboriginal ideas on the environment, Aboriginal ideas on community, on belonging, on immigration, on literature. In some ways it's happening anyway, but we have to willingly say the time has come to do something absolutely radical now. All the universities can't do it at once, all the departments can't do it at once, but I, I think this is the sort of university that actually could surprise everybody by just saying, we're not gonna do it that way anymore. We're gonna do it differently and sit down and say, which department do we start with? Let's try and have a revolution. I would say start with philosophy and literature. Let's have a revolution in philosophy and literature and rebuild something just the way they created years ago the most radical medical faculty at McMaster by going at it completely differently. Let's do the same thing here with the humanities. Have the talent, have the brains, and I think the drive. And this would be a good place to do it. Thank you. Thank you so much, John Ralston Saul. Wonderful a revolution in philosophy and literature. I hope we'll take that as an inspiration. It certainly is wonderful. I'm born on the 14th of July, and so in that sense, it's revolution. I'm calling <laughs> it's not for. The so let's stay away it's a from that. Kind of let's stay away from that altogether. <laughs> Super. What a fantastic start here into our discussion. And now, of course, we want to open up uh, to the audience itself. And I would like to extend the uh, invitation to people in the back again. Again, there's a wonderful row over here which would allow people to really engage with our panelists over there. So feel absolutely free while we get set up over here to just come down and uh, take a seat over here. And, you you uh, make us nervous standing at the back. <laughs> there's this empty row at the front, as if you were all Protestants, you know, who can't sit in the front. You know. <laughs> Maybe they are planning the revolution, so. <laughs> So at this point, we welcome your comments, your questions, your musings, your provocations, your revolutions, your advocacies, and uh, uh, there are many different ways of, of course, of uh, bringing these questions to uh, our table here. The only thing that we would like to ask you to do is that you first uh, uh, state your name and uh, affiliation. If you do have an affiliation, no worries if you don't. And second, that you keep your questions and comments and musings uh, focused and short so that we can include as many of you as we can. Uh, you can also post questions and comments uh, on Twitter and to do so, very, very simple, uh, use our hashtag which is uh, humanity's future, humanity's future as a one word. 
Um, we would like uh, to also ask the panelists to keep their questions sort of relatively short and think of this as a conversation. So lots of turn taking is what uh, we are after. And uh, now I would like to turn to our audience and uh, ask uh, are there any questions to start us off, any plans to take us into the revolution that has been proposed. Uh, let's get some of the ideas uh, to our panelists and uh, let's engage them. Please. I'm a retired engineer, so I understood humanities to include economics. <laughs> so it seems to be such a, an umbrella term. But for example, economics included some of the ideas in, in, in humanities, in other words, like Hayek's ideas about individualism and the perfect market. So it would appear to be there are wars inside the humanities. So when we talk about the humanities, obviously, to me, there seem to be wars there. And the, the wrong side, in my opinion, are winning a war. And um, the, uh, of course, I'm all in favor of culture and learning and all of the good things that are there. But inside all of these ideas, there can be very poisonous ideas. The idea is that uh, the cultured people, the Nazis, the cultured people, when they were busy after the operating the gas chambers, they went home and they might have read poetry, listened to nice music, loved their children. And then the Sears building, you know, all the people were fired over there a few weeks ago, presumably by lots of people with humanities degrees. So to, to some extent, I'm just wondering, to what extent can the good people inside the humanities fight the good fight because over my the last 40 years in Canada I wonder how many of those companies up there if they got the word from head office okay we have to cut down on the cost fire another 50 people how many of those people are going to avoid, you know go back to their lessons on empathy in other words I think the mode of production is a big big issue and uh, maybe we're struggling to try and influence the tail rather than the, the dog Thank and, you, and more recently, then you have civilized Western societies justifying legalizing torture. You have Americans going to war with the Brits, killing possibly a million people in Iraq. You have Canadian soldiers killing farmers as heroes uh, in, in, in Afghanistan for the last 15 years. These poor bastards wouldn't even know where Toronto is, and they're getting bombed daily by no doubt by people with humanities degrees as well as engineering degrees. Mm -hmm. So again, there are real problems and um, best, best of wishes, mm -hmm. best of wishes to you all. <laughs> Can Any I just comments? comment on The Economist? Uh, let's put it this way. Uh, economics as it was uh, established was indeed, in my view, part of the humanities and the economic historians in a sense were the leaders in the thinking in that field. But what you've seen over the last 40 years is the gradual elimination of economic historians and the promotion of microeconomists who are essentially statisticians without purpose, in a way, and macroeconomists who are, are, are increasingly mesmerized by the microeconomists. So in a way, I think what you've seen over the last 40 years is e economics, with some exceptions, slipping out of the humanities into a kind of utilitarian field which thinks it's a science, which it is not. And so you've actually seen the, the economics field be cozying up, if you like, to the management schools, which again is a utilitarian field. So it's a very precise thing that's been happening. There are exceptions to the rule. Of course, there are economists who are p still part of the humanities, but they're basically not rewarded in many places. They're, they're very marginalized, even now, even with the failure of the microeconomists and the macroeconomists. It's just... Did you come? Thank you. Any other comments? Well, I, could I add w one thing to this? And, and that is that, um, in my view, the scholarly disciplines are not at war with one another. We do live at a time in which the humanities are sometimes accused of being on the attack, being at war because we are defending a fairly difficult moment. but. The claim that the humanities are irrelevant, which is a very common claim now, is I think especially rife, because, precisely because they are not irrelevant, precisely because they make some very trenchant and important arguments. 
I think the capitals are coming down on many of the formal academic disciplines, and we are all in each other's world in radical kind of ways. I am not against an interdisciplinary engagement with engineers and with scientists. I'm at the University of Alberta. I'm part of a team that's trying to make mountain studies foundational to our university's core mission, <laughs> to its idea. And we are trying to make it possible for students to take certificates that would give them a BA in science, arts, uh, environmental studies, native studies, uh, physical education and recreation, but to focus on the interdisciplinary mountain studies. And so that I'm very involved in those kind of uh, enterprises, and I support them fully. Uh, engineers are, are, are very close to my heart, too. And I think we can work together in meaningful ways. But we are at a time when a rising discourse of corporate instrumentalism is causing us to basically find not our common ground and our best selves, but in fact that competition that Marianne spoke of between ourselves. And I quite agree that we have to resist that master narrative of competition, that master narrative of corporate instrumentalization, if we are to save ourselves. Thank you very much. Other questions? organizing the departments and that one of them might be the English department and some of us from the English department are here and we'd I think might be curious as to how you would start us off we're a bit <laughs> cautious to stick our foot in our mouths and say something we shouldn't <laughs> could you start us off on that discussion well I, I think I made the point I mean I think there's you know you have a country that functions in two languages both originally European languages, but I think have been deeply changed here. Uh, it would be very interesting just to begin by saying, well, how could we uh, deal with literature in a way which takes the wall, which doesn't say that the world is structured according to a, a linear path that starts in one place in that language and moves gradually through time, you know, th through styles and time in that language. And perhaps it doesn't, perhaps it works in other ways and that language plays a much more interpenetrating role. For example, I'll give you, you know, law, uh, it is, if you go and talk to the Supreme Court justices, they will tell you that law in Canada is um, uh, a mix, it, uh, but an unidentifiable mix of uh, what came out of England, what came out of France, which then met up with Aboriginal law here, which radically changed the way those laws were applied in Canada already in the 17th and 18th and 19th century. And now all the victories at the Aboriginals at the Supreme Court over the last 30 years have reconfirmed the changes that were made to European law in Canada to make it Canadian in the 17th, 18th and 19th century. And those, those uh, civil and uh, common laws are melded together in a way that our kind of national legal institutions, we sort of say we have two legal codes that come out of Europe, but in the reality is when they actually start making judgments, they're making judgments based on a, a, on a kind of meshing of all of that into a local experience. So that when you then turn around and say, well, who, who looks at, our, when, when Supreme Courts around the world are making judgments and they want to get references from elsewhere, who looks at ours? And who do we look at? And then you start to see, well, actually, the people who look at each other a lot are the people who have Aboriginal populations look at each other, being functioning Aboriginal populations. Federations look at each other. Um, people who believe that you can get by without civil wars and violence look at each other. And the result is there's very little reference, for example, from Canada to the United States or to Britain or to France. Almost none. The references are to Germany, Australia, New Zealand. We, we basically wrote with the South Africans their constitution because they were looking for something that would work for a multiracial, multilinguistic federation. So in other words, law, even though many of the law faculties haven't admitted this, many have, law has really begun to restructure itself in a way which reflects the civilization. And then they go around looking for countries that are interested in, those, the, in that. Well, I think one could start thinking about literature in the same way. Okay. And I think we have Mariana on that same question as well of how do we restructure English departments in positive ways. 
So I, um, my job at MLA was a three-year position. You're vice president for two years and then you're president. And, and uh, as soon as I got elected, the executive director asked me what, what did I want to do? And I said, I, I know exactly what I want to do, but you're going to hate me. What I want to do is restructure the structures of knowledge of the association because uh, the MLA is divided by divisions and discussion groups that are the kind of cornerstone, intellectual cornerstones of the field. The last time they were restructured was in 1974, exactly 40 years ago. Things were added since, but the basic building blocks have remained the same. And their um, languages, their, their national literatures, there's some interdisciplinary fields, um, and then some comparative fields. But we take them for granted, and the fact that literature is divided by centuries, I mean, who decided that the century was the main categories <laughs> right. in which right. we um, <laughs> think about literary um, production? Um, and so I undertook that with a working group. We had lots and lots, some of you may be members, we have mm. lots and lots of consultation um, on the, our new in, um, platform, web platform, the MLA Commons. and. Um, we had the main um, literatures, which were English, French, Spanish, Italian, um, and German. And then we had the other languages. They were listed under other. The map looked the way it would have looked 40 years ago. It was very, a really difficult process. There's tons of resistance to rethinking and to revolutionizing precisely in the way you suggest and in the way you ask. Why is there such resistance? I think the crisis mentality and the cutting of costs and the fact that we have to defend ourselves has prevented us from thinking forward about what we might want to teach and how and how, what kind of research we actually do and how to map that on to those categories. So it was a really difficult process because nobody, everybody this, um, agreed that new things had to be included, but nobody wanted to give up anything lest they lose a position or their positions Absolutely. Cut, or things like that. So, I mean, for example, um, smaller and smaller units in, 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 in the discipline we call English, whatever that is, right? And huge units in other parts of the world. So we have, you know, two divisions for 18th century English, but one for Africa, okay? Yeah. Uh, where does Canada fit into this? It's a real problem. I mean, we do have a Canada forum. That Some to the edge. <laughs> well, is it English? Is it American? It's not American because American is U.S. How, where's the hemisphere? It, these are, it, it was a really, really interesting conversation. But I think if we were allowed to think, if we we're allowing our, our, ourselves to think about what we're actually doing rather than, well, wait a minute, we might lose some little turf, it would have been a much more creative conversation that we could have had. Thank but, you. But that, that, in a way, is why the, the measurement, the sort of national, uh, continental, international measurement thing is such a problem because it actually hands power to whatever the conservative, conservative in the sense of no change dominant group is. And that's why the, the real way to make the change is actually within, you, you know, one or two universities get together and say, let's try in our two universities to do something radical. People will come if it's interesting. And then people will say, that's an interesting place. But that means stepping outside the measurement of who's got the best English department or, you know, we've got to step outside that. And we also have Stephen on that question. Just briefly, it's so important to make the distinction between the kind of change that happens because we perceive ourselves to have to jump through hoops in order to establish the value of our work, and the kind of change that happens from the kind of conversations that have been going on for the entire time I have been in English studies. <laughs> um, the humanities change from within. They change in part in response to the aspirations of the students who come to them and who seek social change. But when I went to Queen's University in the early 1970s, an, my English department looked nothing like what English departments are now. And that they have, his, the humanities have historically provided welcome ground to the marginalized who come to seek change. The post-colonial studies has come, uh, cultural studies, gender studies, queer studies, and so on. But I do think that we don't want to let that instrumentalist force also package us uh, away, or displace and, and, and package and displace our own very strong desire to 
to advance much more quickly the re reform movements with our, within our own disciplines. And I quite agree with, the, with John on this, that it should not be possible for an undergraduate student in a Canadian university to graduate without having been given genuine and meaningful access to the literatures and the orators and the art forms and the musical traditions and the philosophies and the traditions and the ecologies of Canada's first peoples. It makes no sense that that should happen in Canada, and we really should move forward in that direction. Thank you very much, and we have uh, more questions. I can wait. The microphone here to the front, please. Uh, sorry. <laughs> Thank, Thank you. you. It's Lisa Phillips uh, here for the Federation. And I share your skepticism about measurement. Uh, however, we do need to persuade um, the public to underwrite us as humanists. And I guess one of my question is, um, how do we find our champions outside the academy who can um, speak and advocate? Because when we defend ourselves, when we speak for ourselves, uh, it's difficult not to be heard as uh, defending our turf. Mm -hmm. or as a, there's a self-interested piece there of resisting change or resisting accountability. And so what I'd like to, to get your thoughts on, anyone here in the room, um, maybe John has some thoughts about how do we find um, people in other sectors who maybe have graduated with a humanities degree, who are leading a major institution, uh, or where are these people who could speak out uh, not from within the academy but from having appreciated its value? I mean, I, I don't want to... You know, I use the word relevance in the sense of you live somewhere, people live somewhere, they live inside a civilization or inside a part of a civilization and it has to make sense inside that civilization. Um, I think you would be amazed that if you, if the humanities acted in that way more, that you would find the support. I think already, as you, as you just described, I mean, the, by, by bringing in all sorts of other communities, people should say, oh, well, that's, that's where they're doing that kind of work. That's called relevance, you know? But I think it needs to go much, much further. I think a lot of Canadians, you know, look, um, uh, 40 years ago, there was no French immersion schooling in Canada, and the schooling system for Francophone minorities were going down the tube because of, there were no protections for them, et cetera. Today, as I said, in those days, the number of Anglophone Canadians who spoke French and read French mm -hmm. were probably about 10, and I think I know them all, you know, <laughs> this sort of thing. And, um, and, and, you know, today, half the bilingual, bicultural people in Canada are Anglophones, right? Mm -hmm. They come up through the high school system, and as they get into grade 9 or 10, their teachers start to say to them, you better get out of French immersion. Why? Well, you want to get into university, don't you? Well, what's it? well, you know, universities have an entrance exam system, which is based on the European model, which is based on the measurement competitive model, and they're not interested in the fact that you're an Anglophone in a French immersion thing, and you might not get the same level of marks in English because you did it in French, and therefore you're going to be penalized. Instead of saying, isn't it absolutely fantastic? Because not only are these kids bilingual, but most of the people who've learned Spanish or Chinese or Portuguese are the people coming out of immersion schooling. So they're often trilingual. And those people are penalized because the universities are still following this European, North American model that streams and says, oh, well, you're an Anglophone. You have to get these kind of marks to get in as an Anglophone. And then, you know, and we don't care that you've done this other very interesting, very humanist thing. Because let's not forget mm -hmm. that speaking more than one language is central to the humanist tradition. Right? Thank you. Now, in Canada, French would be the logical second one, but it might be others. In th speaking three or four is the sign of an intellectual. So I fail, because I can only do three. <laughs> You're asking a really important question. I don't think we should get let go of measurement. We can't. We can't. I mean, the, that train has left the station. We can't just say we're not going to measure. I, I have to quote that essay by Judith Butler again, because she did something so beautiful. She said, measure, it's part of our whole tradition. What about meter in poetry? What about measure in music? Why can't we just uh, appropriate that language and see what we can do with it if we appropriate it and think about measurement in more creative ways? So, I mean, I, I don't know how you translate that into who's speaking for us, but I just a nice thought that I think we could stay with for a bit. And on bilingualism, 
we need you in the US to articulate the value of, of being bilingual. I mean, this country is so <coughs> way ahead of where the US is, where we were talking about English as the nat national language and try to get the Spanish speaking kids to forget their Spanish so that they would do better in their tests. I think we need the articulation of why it's important to be bilingual. The MLA issued a statement two or three years ago saying every US citizen should be bilingual. Now, what power does that statement have? We, we need more than statements. We really need to get uh, to, to, to figure out how in the fabric of our everyday lives and our ways of thinking, that makes us people who think more creatively by knowing two languages and therefore multiple cultures. Oh, Stephen. There are so many men in our consumerist culture who are so very anxious about measurement. And my own <laughs> feeling is that we tend to go to such men when we seek our community voices. And what they tend to do is to reinstall the, the, the dominant narrative. And that is the business person who says, yes, this is the kind of person I want to hire, or that Google is hiring up all the English uh, graduate student, uh, students. And I, I think these are valuable arguments. But I have actually not seen the evidence that Canadian society really has diminished in its belief in the value of the humanities and the value of, of training in and around that. I do not think this is true. And I think that what too often gets called, quite wrongly, ordinary Canadians are, do support our work. I think there's much stronger support in communities. And I will just say one small example. Uh, with my writing partner, we are writing a history of Cana early Canadian mountaineering, in, especially in the national parks. And this was a, a history that involved the massive disenfranchisement of First Nations and Métis people from the parks. So we sought community partners in order to do this work. And that was the Alpine Club of Canada and the Association of Canadian Mountaineering Guides and Parks Canada and so on. But we also went to the Stony Nakoda Nation and said, we seek to get the story right, not to write your story, but we can't do this outside of a kind of a partnership. And we found there that what they said to us was, people don't come to us in advance of forming their research projects. They work them all out in advance, they get them funded, and then they yeah. come in and ask us to be kind of native informants for those kind of projects. And it is never an equal partnership within it. Until we actually start building the kind of research projects that focus not narrowly on what our government is telling us counts as economic prosperity, but really goes to the notion of social wealth. We will not build those collaborations with the community. And that is the answer I would give to that problem, Lisa. My sense is that we have support that we have not really learned how to mobilize. Thank you very much. Other questions? Can we get the microphone? Sorry about all the sprinting, but it keeps us busy. Thank you. My name's Lily Cho. I teach at York University in the Department of English. And uh, I have two things I'd like to say. I guess the first, I, I hadn't meant to do this, but Marianne, when you were talking about measurement, it reminded me of something that I grew up with, so I'll just share it very briefly with the room. Uh, my f the first poetry I learned was Tang Dynasty poetry. Uh, there's a collected po a series, 300 poems from the Tang Dynasty. My father taught them to me when I was very little. I didn't actually know what they meant. Uh, but he taught them to me because he was in prison during the Cultural Revolution and was put in solitary a lot. And he marked time by reciting those poems. And he would mark time through the revolutions of the poetry as he sat uh, in his cell. And so it seemed to me that he was trying to tell me something <laughs> about changing how I understood the movement of time in relation to language. It should not have surprised my parents that I did not become the medical doctor or the chartered accountant of their dreams and instead pursued a uh, doctorate in English literature. Uh, and, and, I, and now I come to the question. Uh, in, in one of the hats I wear right now is as undergraduate program director for the Department of English. And one of the surprising things about, so there are, two, there are a couple things that happen in this job that I'm only just learning, because nobody told me that this would happen. Um, one of them was, is that uh, every week, dozens of students come to my office uh, terribly afraid about their future and about what job they'll get. And we talk about that in all kinds of ways, as best as I can figure out mm. how to do it. Uh, the other thing that happens, which was also enormously surprising, was a weird retail part of the job, where on certain weekends, I meet with parents on preview days. And I try to tell them how great it is that their 
kids are interested, that their children are interested in coming to York University to study English or the humanities or whatever, whatever table I happen to have been stationed at. Uh, <laughs> I'm, you know, and, and having worked years in retail, I'm actually pretty good at it. But, mm. but, but it was always very surprising. I got, you know, I'm just, I'm, I'm, I'm shilling a bit, right? And, and again, what I encounter in that experience, uh, and I've done it a few times now, is in a lot of fear, right? So there's this desire. These parents, uh, and, and, and for those who don't know, you know, York University, I don't remember the exact number because I'm terrible with numbers, but I think 60% of our students are the first p uh, student, people in their family to have gone to university, right? So we have a very diverse population, uh, and a population of, of students who are taking enormous risks perhaps not unlike the Ryerson population. And, uh, and I, I meet with these parents, and I'm asking them to trust in a future they can't know. Right? So I'm saying to them, how great it is that your, your kids are interested in pursuing a degree in literature. Here are all the wonderful courses they can take. Uh, but mm -hmm. I know why you're worried, and I know why you're anxious. Uh, and I'm going just to tell you, don't worry, <laughs> it's going to be fine. You need to trust in a future you can't know. And that this degree, unlike seeing your child in a, in a, in a chartered accounting program where there seems to be a really obvious end, it's, it's, it's not that. But you have to sort of trust in a future you can't know. And, and of course, that's not a very comforting thing to tell parents who work very hard and try to send their children to school. So, so my question, I'm sorry this is taking so long, but my question to the panels is, you know, what, what you've done so wonderfully tonight is articulate a series of futures for the humanities. Uh, but I wonder if you could speak to how we can learn to trust in the unknowable parts of the future that I think the humanities have been so good at asking us to believe in. Thank you. Mm. Yeah, great. Anybody wants to take that on? It's a beautiful question, actually, the unknowable parts of the future. Um, I mean, I think that's precisely what one might tell parents, um, precisely is uh, that um, there isn't a field or a career right now, given uh, the economic picture of the last 20 or 30 years, right? That is um, a surefire, money-making, um, secure field. When I decided to go into um, literature, my father, who was a Holocaust survivor and an engineer who moved to the United States as an immigrant but had a really good um, education in something practical, like engineering, was able to get a job. It was the early 1960s. He was just able to get a job within a few days, even though he didn't really know English. Mm -hmm. But he knew how to do structural engineering. And he thought the same would be true for me if I went into a, a scientific or, or, or technical field. Um, when in the 1980s, a lot of engineers lost their jobs in the crisis, in the Reagan crisis, um, I had tenure in literature, and I said to him, see, you know, uh, this job's <laughs> not as good job, you know, but for a tenure in the university in literature, um, have a job for life, and your young engineering colleagues that you helped educate are losing their jobs. And, but I think it's the unknowability precisely that um, just, we, we really don't know what to tell, what the future will bring. So maybe what we can offer our students is ways of thinking about these problems. And we need, and as I said before, we need to articulate the creativity of thinking and um, the improvisational qualities that come from understanding the, um, not just humanities, but um, new ways of thinking and ways of putting things together that aren't beholden to old ways of doing things, which includes the way we've structured our disciplines. And I think we need to cut across the disciplines as they've been uh, configured and think about problems and how we're going to approach problems. So I love the mountain as a, mm -hmm. as a, a thing to study, as an object of study. I hadn't really thought about that. I thought of the oceans, for example, have, which have become really important. But you know, how can we maybe structure objects of study differently in order to look to the future. Thank you very much. Anything to add? Well, Lily, I would say that your own work, your own research, seeks 
the difficulty in the stories of diasporic citizens in Canada, stories that are not told and are not built well enough. And I suppose if there's one argument I'd really want to advance, it's the, the one that says that our own students bring such a wealth of stories to us and we don't necessarily tell those stories and the trust in the future is to tr trust in those students. So I'm struck by the fact that the humanities has 60% uh, of students in Canada are, uh, in the humanities are women and um, that the humanities and the social scientists teach 59% of our students and we get 12% of the funding. And what is going on here is a disarticulation dis between research and teaching. Um, the thing that is bothering me most about this is that the idea that is emerging very much in the corporate university that teachers teach and researchers research and that this should happen. I think this is wholly wrong and it is completely against the spirit of, of the question that you say trust in, in the future. The purpose of the university is to teach and the purpose of research is to support that teaching. It is one of the reasons why when people argue for basic or what they call curiosity driven research, they don't mean that at all. What they really mean is that they who are the teachers understand that the, 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 when they fo focus on their research projects, they are doing it in a way that is inclusive of their students, that is empowering for their students, that imagines a way of bringing them to, to the difficulty of the material and bringing them forward within that one. And it is when we go into the research excellence kind of model that gets these people who who come to universities and never get distracted by a real student, that the idea that that is the research we should do is, is simply not right. And so I think that the research, uh, that the humanities might find some strength in remembering who our students are, what their stories are, and how we bring that together. And just one point about this one. One of the facts that, one of the statistics always brought against the humanities is that we're not doing as much for international students as are the other disciplines. We're at 8% and domestic students are at 17% of humanities and so therefore we need to do more to attract the rising market of full paying international students. And my sense here is that this competitive language is distracting us from doing precisely the kind of work that would make the work that we do as the message gets out more attractive to international students. So I love the question about those indeterminate kind of futures and, and I love the point about trusting them. It's exactly what I think we need to do in the humanities. Uh, sorry. <laughs> um, you know, the, when we're talking about measurement, not the, the kind of measurement that you're talking about, but the, the utilitarian form of measurement, um, you're, you're, you're talking about when it's dominant in society, it's, it's, it, it, it's a theory of truth. It's a theory of certainty. And there's no question that this theory of certainty, which is pushed out through the corporate, corporatist methods, mm -hmm. through the dominance of the business schools and the managerial idea, leads parents to think, well, there, there must be the possibility of certainty that we need to know and that this is very much the message of the last few decades. Who can tell us? We need to know. Now, the interesting thing is that the other school, which I think the humanities at their best represent, is, is, is the question of doubt. Living comfortably with doubt, with uncertainty. Dem dictatorships are based on certainty. Certainty is based on fear. People are afraid they require certainty. The people who use fear for power, play the game of fear and certainty. In a, de in a democracy or a, so a society with responsible, engaged individuals, you live with doubt. That's the essence of democracy. You don't know. You don't know because everybody's different, because things are happening, because things are changing. And there's no question that the school of doubt, the humanist school, um, is not the one which is vaunted publicly as a way to run society, but in fact, it's a very effective way of running society, but it's not a comfortable way of running it. So I think w one of the reasons that I said, and I think my, my friends agree with me, is that we have to be really careful about arguing back against the language of certainty, which is the language of fear, which is producing today things like populism, because the language of certainty has failed to produce the prosperity and certainty it said it would produce. So it simply accentuates more and more the fear and the parents get more and more worried. So we have to be intellectually stronger and stronger 
arguing back about, you know, uncertainty is not a bad thing in a democracy. Living with doubt is realistic in a democracy. The people who can live with doubt are the people who will be able to deal with losing their job. Mm -hmm. The people who are obsessed by certainty will not know how to deal with losing their job. We're, it's a far better way of, of, of uh, form of education in a period which is a period of great uncertainty. And you know, you know, I'll give you a tiny example. I was talking with a brilliant young person the other day who's doing a PhD in the healthcare area, and this person kept saying the healthcare industry. And after a little while, I said, well, "Why are you calling it an industry?" And they said, "Well, that's what they tell us to call it. It's an industry." And I said, "Well, well, the word industry." comes with adjectives and adverbs and sentences and paragraphs. If you accept that the healthcare is an industry, essentially you're accepting the language of 19th century capitalism. You're accepting that it should be privatized and that it should be profit, profitable. And, and this person said to me, oh, I've never heard anything like that before. <laughs> you know, and I said, this is the most amazing thing that I'm having this conversation. That, so we're not fighting back hard enough. Mm -hmm. Making, you know, uh, whenever I'm in a meeting and somebody says the word stakeholder, I just start laughing my head off, really loud. <laughs> and then they stop the meeting and they say, what's the problem? And I explain that it's essentially a Mussolinian term, that it, it's profoundly anti-democratic, that it means you won't allow anybody into the meeting who's a citizen unless they're self-interested. And then they, they stop and they don't know where to go because you've destroyed their argument, their language. So I think that we have to be, and, and it's part of what it sounds like you're doing anyway, which is that we have to be very, aggressive is the wrong word, very imaginative and open about the fact that educating kids with doubt and uncertainty is the greatest force and tool you can possibly give them. Yeah, educating kids with the certainty of measurement is a fool's paradise. I'm just wondering if we could get uh, at least one of the uh, Twitter questions. So we have, for example, Michael Rice, who is asking, can Canadians, can Canada's tradition of, and I believe this means pluralism, is that correct? It's very far, okay. Can, can Canada's tradition of pluralism inform the humanities, question mark? How does diversity and pluralism permeate Canadian academia? Can we get a quick response on that? Should I read it again? No. Okay. No. Ken? That's pretty clear. I think that's clear. <laughs> but so, I mean, that's the point I was making about the relevance mm -hmm. of the humanities. Yeah. If you live in a city that's like this city, the humanities in some way has to be able to speak to that. Otherwise, you're essentially teaching the humanities as if you were living in France. And then you end up, then you end up in the disastrous situation that the government of Quebec is. When, when the Prime Minister of Quebec, Madame Beauvoir, started talking about the Charter of Values, I kept saying, that's very odd. She's using sentences which are straight out of the night, nightly news in Paris. Yeah. And of course, you know, if you speak French in Canada, your only other option is French news. And of course, she was using all this language which was used for the most disastrous European country in terms of dealing with diversity. And then one night she actually said on the news, you know, we have been inspired by the policies of the French government, the most successful government in Europe in terms of integration. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know? So, you know, we have to be very conscious that, that what, the way in which we're dealing with literature in some way, and philosophy in some way, has to deal with the fact that we are living in a very cutting edge revolutionary city. And a very courageous in some ways country in terms of immigration and citizenship policies has its ups and downs. We have to be able to reflect that in our ideas so we can talk mm -hmm. about it in an interesting way. Uh, first of all, I uh, thank all three of you for sharing your perspectives on the humanities, whether you're looking at the past, the present, or as the young lady back here has mentioned, the future generations. And uh, I have some very courageous and very um, difficult conversations as well, especially with parents, on selling them of the idea that perhaps her department is one they should uh, yeah. seek towards in terms of their children and them uh, hopefully having a prosperous future. I think what you know is also a staple is the fact that today is the 180th anniversary of our city, the great city in which we mm -hmm. live in today. Um, and I think many people here would agree with me that I think that we can have a great party at Harborfront, perhaps at City Hall itself, 
in the, in the ice rink area or even here in the backyard of Ryerson uh, where I attended school. I don't think we need to go on Jimmy Kimmel to celebrate Toronto's uh, birthday. Um, so on that note, Recently, the CBC uh, had a uh, Canada Reads series where they were judging a series of books. And mm -hmm. to see that Joseph Boyden, a young writer uh, of Aboriginal, as um, John has mentioned, of Aboriginal heritage, uh, winning this award with the Orenda, beating out a veteran person in Miss Atwood uh, in particular, and I was someone who I really do admire as well, is says something about our country, says something about how we're growing as a nation, and it also says something about how the humanities has certainly impacted the consciousness and the landscape of Canadian society. I think that is undoubtedly, and I think that we have to give ourselves much more credit than sometimes we do. On that note itself, I also think that in terms of teaching students, for myself, I always teach them that, you know, if you're in French immersion, that is very valuable because some of the most uh, impressive people of the 20th century have looked towards language in terms of their vehicle mm -hmm. of access in different cultures across the world and being able to communicate and connect on a common humanity in regards to the power of language. And I think that if students understand that, it'll take them much further than the binary uh, understanding of Quebec and the rest of Canada and the idea that French, I'm um, simply learning French in order to be able to communicate with Quebecois or Quebecers. And I think that's very important that we get out of that mm -hmm. kind of thinking. Uh, rather, language is something that's fluid, it's international, it's global, and therefore we should teach skill, uh, uh, students about the importance of linguistic development over the notion of language for uh, currency, for higher pay, or for industrial purposes. Uh, on that note, my question is, how do we then uh, from a humanities perspective on the panel, perhaps Stephen can touch on this, how do we um, use the humanities in order to, or how do we perceive, sorry, how does the humanities itself perceive something like the Charter of Values? When you look at that in terms of that policy itself, what does it say about our nation? And what does it say in terms of how does the humanities then perceive a particular piece of legislation like that that ha could have serious effects and serious consequences for the rest of Canada? Number one. Number two, for John, I think, what can we uh, use today from the past to teach students to see the humanities in terms of economics, not from the idea of statisticians and numbers or quote unquote measuring up, but rather in terms of what does the humanities offer to, or what can we eke out of the uh, studies of economics from a humanities perspective? How can we infuse humanities with economics, especially today, to show students that economics is a valuable, not just in terms of business and, um, and business industries, but rather in other social good ways? Mm. Thank so you. Thank you very much. Maybe just some very, very quick responses because we are already over time. So we do want okay. to wrap up even though it's been riveting. So let's just swing into action with the final question. Well, you have called me out with a series of questions of formidable di difficulty. So, so I will just tear off a part of the direct question you asked me about the Chateau de Valeur and to say that, needless to say, uh, I am very uncomfortable with the kind of legislation that makes a lack of religious and cross-cultural literacy a marker of social belonging. And I do not know anybody in the Punjabi community in Edmonton who is not made nervous by this legislation or this proposal. At the same time, I want to say that we are not in sufficient dialogue with people in Quebec in order to really feel deeply into the nuance of those things. And the rush to judgment that I see in places like the National Post makes me much more nervous in some ways than the actual legislation itself. You talked about those students and the parents and their expectations, and I do know, not know anybody in my world who has not had the experience of students who come caught in the incommensurability of multiple expectations, of following your own dreams in university and following your parents' desire to become the doctor, the lawyer, whatever it is, who has not had to navigate that difficult path. I am full of admiration for the capacity of students to do that. And I think that one way forward is for us stop to worry, stop worrying so much about who owns these students 
and thinking much more about how we teach them. We count majors. Why are we doing this? Why are we only counting people that we are basically putting in our paddock and calling ours? We teach everybody, and in doing so, we teach them in multiple and different ways. So that pluralism is something that we can institutionalize further, and I thank you for your question. Thank you very much, and I think that's actually a beautiful, beautiful wrap-up to our session. I would like to thank all speakers for really, really riveting, provocative, fascinating engagement here. Thank you. And I would also like to extend that to our audience, an audience that has been very, very attentive and with very, very strong questions. And uh, we, I think, had about 120 people here tonight, so a very wonderful turnout as well, which I want to thank you all for. And uh, would just like to say the um, event will be available uh, to view on a RICAST, so if you'd like to review uh, some of the answers, because I know things go by very, very fast. And uh, would also like to thank once again the uh, organizers, the humanities chairs, the dean of arts, Charmaine, Monica, mm -hmm. and especially the English department and NEMA for leadership with this event. Thank you very, very much. who have been going around with the mic all the time, so let's give them a round of applause as well. Okay. And now please join us for tea, coffee, and drinks to continue the conversation a little bit. Thank you very much. <laughs>